partner and leader Dr. Grape was. And if anyone would care to donate to his memorial fund, um, you may use the uh, QR code on the screen. So moving on to today's lecture, I'm Stacey Heilman. I'm Associate Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Pediatrics at Emory University, and I'm a member of Core 4 related to the ACME POCT, which I'll tell you about momentarily. This is, um, we sponsor the Global Lectures Uniting Everyone, sponsors these, these, these talks that you're about to hear today. The ACME POCT is the home for GLUE. This is an overall entity that's funded by the NIH, NIBIB to be specific, and it's really its goal wow. is to insist and enable invest and ventures from across the country who develop microsystems-based point-of-care technologies. We really want to help with uh, proof of concept and beyond, looking at clinical testing, as well as refining the technology and really accelerating that pathway to translation and clinical adoption. The structure of the ACME POCT is shown in this slide. We've got the overall entity of the administrative core that runs the pilot processes and overall leadership of the core. We've got a technology core that's like led by Dr. Vogel, who will be facilitating today's talk. The clinical core that's led by Greg Martin. And then the dissemination core that's over here that's led by Eric Neal, and I'm a member of. And I wanted to point out to you that everything that we do is encapsulated in these boxes. But what I've highlighted here is disseminating best practices. And so that's what we're here to do today, to disseminate best practices and lateral flow assays and talking about the, the nanomaterials and nanotechnology that might underlie that. And so now I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Vogel, who will introduce today's featured speaker. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, yes, again, my name is Eric Vogel. I'm a professor at, at Georgia Tech and lead our technology core. And it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Arben Marcosi, who is currently the ICREA professor and director of the Nanobioelectronics and Biosensors Group at ICN2, uh, which is situated at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Uh, among other things, Professor Makoshi is co-editor-in-chief of Biosensors and Bioelectronics, and he's published over 338 articles uh, related to cutting-edge nanotechnology and nanoscience-based biosensors with interest for uh, diagnostics. Um, and with that, uh, Professor Makoshi, please uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Eric, for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation to you and colleagues. Uh, uh, let me uh, try to share my screen first. So you can see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes, looks good. Yep. Okay. So, uh, good day to everyone. Uh, good afternoon from uh, Barcelona. Uh, here it is uh, uh, four thirty p.m. It's a pleasure for me to uh, uh, speak today with you about uh, what we are doing in Barcelona in relation to uh, lateral flow, but uh, especially on lateral flows that are based on nanomaterials. Uh, that new generation of lateral flow that are with interest for uh, virus diagnostic application. And so it's a pleasure, a honor for me uh, to give this uh, seminar in the context of Oliver Brand Memorial Lecture Series. So thank you very much again for the invitation. As you can see here, uh, there are different logos so in my presentation, in my slides, uh, because uh, uh, I belong, my center, my group, the research group I am leading in Barcelona, belong to se se several entities. So we are part of Barcelona Institute of Science and Technology. We are part of CERCA, uh, Network of Research Centers in uh, Catalonia. Uh, we are fin financed by uh, regional government, General of Catalonia, and of course, uh, Spanish government, SESIC, uh, and we are part of, uh, in the, situated in the Autonomous University of Barcelona campus. 
So I'll speak to you a little bit first as a brief introduction about uh, uh, what we are doing, uh, the group, and then uh, I'll move to the importance of point of care devices, lateral flow, uh, overall in health applications. But then I'll give you some examples with uh, uh, paper-based sensors, lateral flows uh, with interest for different applications, and finally some conclusions. So as I said, this is my center, Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, uh, that is in uh, Beaterra. You see here, uh, this uh, campus is uh, uh, Beaterra campus. Uh, if you see this uh, mountain here, behind this mountain is Barcelona. Uh, so we are in this very nice area with several other, other research centers. ICN2 is here. We have uh, uh, Material Science Institute, uh, Electronic Institute, Autonoma University of Barcelona is in this campus. And also we have Synchrotron in the campus. It's a very nice campus with uh, a cluster of nearly uh, 750 scientists and technicians working in the area of materials uh, science, micro and nanotechnologies for different uh, applications. So the group I, I am leading, Nanobioelectronics and Biosensors, is uh, aiming to uh, develop a new generation of biosensors uh, uh, based on nanomaterials, based on nanotechnologies. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we are very much interested in nanomaterials. We're trying to understand uh, and explore new phenomena related to uh, the properties of nanomaterials and exploit these in uh, either uh, building a new uh, sensing system, but also improving existing uh, sensors, uh, improving their performance uh, uh, in terms of uh, analytical performance, clinical performance, environmental performance, depending on the application. And of course, the application areas are broad. We are very much focused on diagnostics, but also, and when I say diagnostics, I mean not only health-related diagnostics, but also environmental-related diagnostics uh, and monitoring. But also we have interest in food quality, safety and security, in addition to other industrial application. And uh, all we are doing is also related to uh, technology transfer uh, based on the expertise and developments in our group. Uh, we have already two spin-off company, paper drop uh, diagnostics uh, focused on uh, diagnostics using paper and also Graphenica Lab that is uh, uh, mainly focused on the use of uh, uh, graphene patterning, exploited graphene patterning for the development of uh, uh, electronic devices uh, and, of course, uh, biosensors. And you, guys, you can see here there are different nanomaterials we are working. We have been working since many years uh, with metallic nanoparticles, uh, but also uh, porous materials, nanopores, graphene, carbon nanotubes, quantum dots, and other uh, nanomaterials. So the research in our group, uh, as I said, is mostly focused on the study of nanomaterials with interest for, for, for biosensors, but also we have a lot of interest in uh, platforms for biosensors and in this context, paper-based platforms uh, for lateral flow and also electrochemical uh, devices are very, very important. And also for us, uh, important uh, printing technologies, we are using inkjet printing, screen printing, patterning of graphene, uh, using uh, uh, some uh, uh, very uh, patented uh, technologies. Uh, uh, and also we are uh, focused in the full integration of uh, point-of-care devices using smartphone, wearables, wireless readout, with interest uh, for different uh, applications. But going to biosensors, as you know, this is a very interesting uh, field of uh, 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 application, a very interesting technology. I put here just uh, a simple biosensor, the one that everyone knows, uh, uh, glucose biosensor that people can find in any pharmacy in the world. Just to show that uh, this is a very, very broad technology, depending on the receptor uh, or depending on the transducer, you can have different kinds of biosensors. For example, depend if the receptor is an enzyme or DNA or antibodies or aptamers, uh, you can have different kinds of biosensors. And of course, uh, depending on the uh, transducing technology, so uh, the signal that is produced uh, open the recognition 
of the receptor of the analyte by a specific receptor, the signal that is produced here is transduced uh, maybe either electrochemical signal, electrical signal that uh, is related to, to changes going uh, uh, up and down of electro electrons, but also a uh, change of the light or mass and so on. So you can imagine very, very different kind of technologies. And of course, once this recognition is occurring, there is a signal uh, produced here that is measured with this tiny device. Uh, it may be a, a reader that uh, you can find in pharmacy, but also you can do it with your uh, smartphone. So the variety of configurations are emerging uh, uh, of these kind of devices from wearable to, to packaging, uh, smart packaging, implanted device, in vivo format. So you, you may see, uh, you may find different kinds of biosensors uh, depending on the applications. So going to nanomaterials, uh, as I said, we are very much interested in using, exploiting the, the properties of nanomaterials. As you can see here, the different kind of nanomaterials that uh, fit in the size uh, of different kind of analytes like glucose, protein, DNA, and viruses, usually from one to 100 nanometer. So is this range of sizes that make these uh, nanomaterials uh, to work together with uh, different kind of analytes uh, in operation in a biosensing system. Taking advantages, of course, of their interesting properties, physical, chemical, chemical properties, uh, so as to be exploited in a biosensing system. Uh, I'm not mentioning the, the interesting properties you all know, but dark surface to volume ratio, just to, to mention, but also very interesting uh, physical chemical properties, uh, electrocatalytic properties sometimes, or optical properties, plasmonics, uh, fluorescence, and so on. But sensors nowadays are, are everywhere. As you can see in this slide, um, uh, these can be as medical devices, as wearables. Uh, these can be also uh, nowadays even in smart TVs. Uh, everything is, is going to be smart. So smart fridges, smart washing machines, smart houses, uh, environmental monitoring in boy systems, uh, uh, food plant control. So everything to be used also in the future smart cities. So you cannot uh, imagine a smart cities, cities without uh, sensors and biosensors. So the integration nowadays of, of sensors, biosensors with smartphone is uh, something very, very interesting. This is an emerging uh, area of research. Everyone has a smartphone. So it's very easy to connect the smartphone with the sensor. As you can see here in this review wrote many years ago, uh, this uh, uh, smartphone here is connected with uh, a lateral flow or a smartphone is converted to a microscope and more. The interesting example here is from these uh, Google glasses. You see this guy is measuring with these Google glasses uh, lateral flow. So he's uh, reading this lateral flow and the image is uh, uh, transmitted, uh, uh, connected and uh, even going to the uh, medical doctor uh, office uh, so as to get the result. Uh, so uh, the area of biosensors is uh, uh, increasing and increasing. Just to show this uh, uh, biosensor market, for example, in the United States, uh, uh, going uh, increasing uh, different kinds of biosensors. As you can see, for example, here, uh, optical, electrical sensors. So depending on the need, there is a huge market for uh, these uh, kind of devices. And in this context, uh, uh, very, very important are the materials we use to build these devices. As I mentioned before, the kind of substrates, uh, uh, the use of paper, for example, is very, very interesting because uh, it's a low cost, abundant material, easy to manufacture, it's pliable, sustainable, microfluidic properties of paper, uh, it's uh, amazing. So you can uh, just have a, a zero energy device. Uh, so. Uh, liquid running uh, due to the capillary forces. But for these devices to be used as a point of care, uh, we want this to be to fulfill the criteria of being reassured. And this is well known uh, because in most of the analytical devices we want this, uh, but mostly in biosensors. So real-time connectivity, easy of specimen collection, affordable, sensitive, specific, user-friendly, rapid and robust, equipment-free and delivered. So we want these devices to fulfill this uh, uh, reassured criteria 
And to do that, uh, it's very, very important to very carefully study all the components that constitute the architecture of sensor, including even the readers. So sometimes we want to have a naked eye uh, system platform, but also very easy to connect with smartphone, portable, re portable readers. That uh, gives uh, very, very uh, too much advantages, uh, advantages to the, the devices for different applications. So there are a lot of challenges in this area. Uh, just to mention that uh, uh, sometimes we want these devices to be non-invasive, uh, to do a continuous real monitoring. But uh, what is very, very important is the uh, efficiency and cheap for these devices to be cheap, low cost, uh, uh, and sometimes probably disposable, uh, as for example, the cases of uh, uh, COVID tests I will speak uh, later. So there are a lot of challenges. Depending on the application, we should consider each of these challenges and try to fulfill uh, the requisites for the, the typical application we are going to, uh, to offer. So uh, this is a very, very broad area of research. As I mentioned, we are working in all these uh, aspects uh, as uh, summarized here, uh, from nanomaterials to readout to substrates uh, uh, for different applications uh, that are not only uh, health-related applications, but also environment mon monitoring, so the detection of uh, uh, some pollutants. So uh, now I just uh, would like to, to, to enter in the, 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 the case of the diagnostics, so why we need this uh, fast and efficient diagnostic. Uh, so the need for this kind of uh, uh, devices is very, very important. Just to, to remind uh, the COVID-19 that was uh, a tremendous real-world example that we have been living uh, during almost three years. Uh, uh, and during the, this time, it was uh, shown uh, how important is uh, diagnostic for the protection of all the people. So you cannot do any following up and, and therapy without first uh, doing the diagnostics. Uh, and it was a very, very tremendous, tremendous case uh, uh, because during this crisis, we have been uh, 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 living and, and we learned about uh, a lot of uh, infections, a lot of uh, deaths caused by this uh, uh, disease uh, by this pandemic and for that the diagnostics uh, tools are really crucial uh, during the time of uh, pandemics we also wrote this review uh, uh, to, 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 to show the, 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 the community how important is uh, the development of these devices uh, uh, and the collaboration of uh, the, the scientists uh, the academia with industry so we raise the question of the importance of the uh, collaboration during the, the increase of the TRL from the business to academia, uh, uh, working together, uh, because otherwise, uh, if uh, all this development for the con con concept to, to the laboratory testing, clinical trials, regulatory reviews, scaling up and launch of the product uh, to be developed uh, carefully, uh, there is a need uh, to collaborate between the academia and, and business. Uh, so we have more information in this ACS Nano uh, review wrote and precisely uh, focused on, on uh, nano uh, biosensors. The idea we have for these devices is to develop the so-called uh, ubiquitous fabrication of nanobiosensors. So going from centralized production of nanobiosensors to ubiquitous fabrication of nanobiosensors. And this is thanks to the use of very simple uh, printing technologies, uh, uh, fabrication of uh, devices uh, that uh, uh, may avoid even the use of uh, uh, big facility, the big equipments, uh, expensive equipments, uh, uh, and uh, no need for, for cleaner. So using appropriate materials, uh, nano particle based inks and easy protocols uh, and consumer uh, printers and more. It's easy to produce this kind of devices and uh, make possible this ubiquitous fabrication of uh, this kind of devices. Uh, so as to realize even this uh, so-called democratization of diagnostics, uh, uh, thanks to the use of these uh, uh, simple technologies uh, that are in situ, have this in situ and the easy production capability, uh, with low cost, of course, and related to portability, uh, sensitive and reproducible devices, uh, uh, and even equipment free. So going to uh, some of the developments, I would like to mention 
uh, first some uh, uh, typical devices of course these optical devices uh, that we use uh, may be different uh, uh, based on colorimetric first and uh, electrochromic bioluminous and i'll mention uh, some of them first of all entering in the paper-based sensors uh, uh, simple is the best, and why not to use uh, simple devices as simple as, for example, uh, pH paper that uh, we all know. So uh, in every laboratory, we use this uh, uh, simple piece of paper to measure the pH. Why not to use the same concept to measure uh, different things? Uh, and uh, these kind of devices of so paper-based sensors are well known. Uh, since many years as dipstick, LFA, micropads, uh, either with optical but also electrochemical uh, based detection, uh, used in different formats uh, with different advantages, advan disadvantages depending on the application and of course of the format. But these are really very, very interesting, simple devices, but that can be very useful for a lot of applications. So, uh, as I said before, uh, this uh, uh, kind of devices is very, very important to be uh, to fulfill the, 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 the reassuring uh, criteria, uh, as I mentioned before. And this is very, very important because otherwise uh, it's, it's very difficult for these devices to be successful in different applications. Uh, and overall, in this application that are related to the health or the protection of uh, our health, but also environmental monitoring and many other applications. So going to the lateral flow, uh, these are very simple devices. And here is shown a very simple schematic uh, uh, cartoon of uh, lateral flow. Uh, it is composed of a sample pad uh, where the sample is introduced. Uh, we have the conjugation pad where, for example, gold nanoparticles with antipodes are immobilized. Then we have uh, a detection and control line uh, in which uh, antibodies are uh, immobilized. And then we have the absorption pad. There is this video that explains better that than I do. You can see here how this uh, uh, lateral flow is working. So the, the network of the fibers of cellulose are serving also as filter. You see, for example, when the sample is introduced, uh, the, 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 fil the, the fibers are serving as filters. So the, the small uh, particles are going through, but the big ones are... are are remaining on top uh, of these uh, uh, fibers. Then we need to add some, uh, after adding the, the, the sample, we need, may need to add, add some uh, buffer. Uh, and you see then the interaction of the analyte, for example, a protein, or it, even, it can be a virus with uh, antibodies connected with uh, nanoparticles. Everything is running, so we don't need uh, for uh, uh, energy, so microfluidics is, uh, uh, running here, uh, going to the uh, detection line in which uh, the antibodies are interacting, uh, sandwiching the analyte uh, with uh, the other antibody. And the control line is always showing, uh, retaining the gold nanoparticles uh, that are uh, already there, so showing that, uh, that the system is working. So uh, after a couple of minutes, uh, uh, you can see uh, nicely uh, uh, the response with these uh, uh, red lines in the case of gold nanoparticles showing related to plasmonics, uh, uh, in which uh, the, the constant uh, red line is related to the uh, control and the lines that are with different intensities are related to the uh, detection. Uh, and this uh, can be also correlated with the concentration of the light. So this is really a very, very simple uh, system. Uh, so the, the, as I mentioned, the, the different uh, uh, lateral flow devices uh, uh, can be uh, based not only in uh, uh, optical detection, but also there are also electrical based devices in which uh, the detection can be based uh, on electrical uh, signal. Uh, so uh, we are working indeed in both, uh, but I will show mostly here optical devices. Uh, uh, electric devices we are developing are still under development, and I may be able to show this in another uh, moment. Uh, but uh, going uh, again to the uh, principle of lateral flow, as I mentioned, these are uh, all the components of a lateral flow uh, in which uh, 
we try to control all the components uh, uh, so as to make this uh, working together. Uh, you see here also some uh, fibers used in different uh, paths uh, in sample conjugation, uh, detection pad and absorption pad. Uh, so, uh, and this is again here, the operation principle. So the golden particles with antibodies are running and getting in contact, uh, uh, sandwiching the analyte we want to detect. Uh, uh, so this is really a very, very simple uh, device. Indeed, it's doing the same as we do, for example, in ELISA, but now everything is running in a piece of paper. So during the, the, the COVID uh, time, we also wrote this uh, very interesting uh, nature protocol uh, uh, in which we show how one can design uh, and fabricate a uh, whole lateral flow. So there are given a lot of details, uh, uh, protocols, uh, how to prepare the nanomaterial. In this case, for example, uh, gold nanoparticles or even uh, carbon nanoparticles, magnetic nanoparticles, depending on the, on the uh, kind of label you want to, 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 to use, uh, uh, quantum dots and more. Uh, how you uh, could uh, uh, connect this with uh, antibodies uh, and then how to prepare all the paths and run the whole test. Uh, so all the details are given in this uh, protocol, including the fabrication, uh, laminating uh, cards, uh, mounting of the membranes, uh, uh, everything. So soaking of the samples uh, pad and conjugation pad, drying process, uh, all these details are given this protocol and you can get uh, a very, very uh, nice uh, lateral flow, uh, flow to be used uh, uh, for different applications. Also we show in this uh, uh, nature protocol uh, how to treat the results, so imaging uh, and uh, take the capture, the images, and uh, uh, try to do these uh, simple devices uh, as much quantitative as possible. So, because uh, it's not a matter of having a response like yes or no, but also to do a quantification of the uh, analyte. Uh, so, as you can imagine, there are pros and cons of these uh, devices. Uh, so, first of all, as pros, uh, low cost, uh, they are easy to use, uh, fast, uh, naked eye detection is possible, but also there are cons, uh, sometimes uh, is very only qualitative, uh, limit of detection is high, uh, so we need to, to, to reduce it, uh, multiplexing sometimes is not possible. So how we can improve these devices, and this is what we are trying to do, and all our efforts are drived toward uh, improving these uh, devices and make these devices more sensitive uh, uh, by using uh, different uh, uh, strategies. Uh, for example, we are working a lot with the geometry of the devices, uh, uh, using different kinds of bioreceptors uh, to change, to improve the performance. Uh, we are uh, using different kinds of labels, trying to get uh, a better sensitivity, but also readout uh, is very important. Uh, so in relation to geometry, this is a very simple approach in which uh, we try to change the geometry of lateral flow. As you can see here, uh, from the uh, classical geometry, we move to some geometries that are, have different areas of the uh, sample and conjugation pad. You can imagine that if you change the areas of this uh, uh, sample and conjugation pad, uh, absorption pad, uh, the, the, the fluid dicks is going to change. So based on some simple calculation of fluid dicks, uh, we are able to see that uh, uh, these changes were, were uh, related to the change of the performance. It means that uh, uh, based on the change of, of the, 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 the fluid dicks uh, of uh, the buffer, the sample we have there, we are changing the time in, during which uh, the, the, the analyte is in contact with uh, the, the antibodies, so the interaction. So in this way, we are affecting the performance and uh, uh, tuning this performance according to uh, the need. And also we did this not only with uh, just changing the geometry of the device, uh, uh, so instead of cutting and changing the, the area of the, 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 the sample or conjugation pad, uh, we introduce some wax pillar uh, on top of the membrane. As you can see here, by using a wax printing, we are able to uh, print different pillars on top of the surface. Uh, and you can imagine the same. So we are traveling somehow the fluidics uh, on top of these membranes. Uh, so we are again uh, uh, changing the, the, the fluidics uh, uh, that is uh, 
uh, translated to the change of the time of the interaction between the antibodies and antigens. So again, we are able to uh, correlate these uh, uh, changes of the geometry thanks to the changes of the distribution of these pillars uh, with uh, the changes of the uh, performance. Uh, a very interesting and very simple change in geometry he is moving from a lateral flow to a vertical flow. And here is a very, very interesting case in which uh, we mounted the uh, lateral flow inside the shearing. Uh, you can see here this uh, uh, shearing that you can find in any uh, by ev everywhere. Uh, and we use these uh, two cartridges in which we uh, inserted a, a piece of paper, the same as we use in lateral flow in which uh, golden particles with antibodies are there. We use this very interesting device, uh, simple device, uh, uh, to detect uh, uh, prostate cancer biomarker, for which uh, uh, we know that uh, the detection should be done in, in uh, urine. At least five milliliters of urine should be processed. And to do that, uh, we uh, took uh, the, the sample, the urine, five milliliters of urine, uh, by this shearing, and you can imagine here that uh, during this uh, uh, taking uh, of this uh, sample, we are doing a pre-concentration of the, the analyte. So the analyte is uh, uh, now going through the membrane. So directly there, we are measuring uh, the golden particles that are related to the captured analyte. Uh, so we have uh, a very simple device in which. Uh, we don't need to send the sample in the laboratory, clinical laboratory, but we just uh, may do this at home and we take the sample, we uh, take the pictures of the, 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 the piece of paper inside these cartridges and correlate this uh, with uh, the presence, absence of uh, uh, PSA. And we are able to get a nice relation of PSA concentration uh, that is with interest uh, within the, the clinical a range of uh, application. Also using different kind of uh, uh, labels, for example, we also use the iridium oxide nanoparticles. So instead of having this uh, red color, purple color, we have this uh, more intense blue color in which uh, we are still working indeed uh, uh, for different applications so as to have a, a brighter color and more intense color with interest for uh, different uh, applications. Uh, here you have some more details about this, uh, but you can see here clearly how the difference between the golden particle based lateral flow and the iridium oxide, uh, uh, indeed these are some, we call these flowers uh, of uh, iridium, of likes, uh, iridium oxides uh, connected to gold uh, nanoparticles. Uh, and you see the clear difference here between the uh, appearance of the, 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 the colored uh, uh, test uh, in case of gold nanoparticles in comparison to uh, the iridium oxide uh, nanoparticles. Uh, so the, the, the range of uh, response is improved uh, uh, thanks to the use of this uh, label. Also a very interesting label and also the detection system has been in connection to graphene. We have been operating with graphene and trying to get advantages of uh, uh, graphene as quencher of the fluorescence. I'll show you an example in which uh, we use graphene to quench the fluorescence of uh, cadmium selenide quantum dots. Uh, in addition, we have been using graphene to stamp also and to build uh, simple devices. Uh, but uh, to do this, uh, we need first to understand uh, uh, the, the importance phenomena, which is a quenching of the fluorescence when we have a donor uh, and an acceptor. And in this case, it's well known that the distance between the donor and acceptor for the uh, quenching of fluorescence to occur is crucial. And it goes from 10 nanometer to 30 nanometer in the case of graphene. We uh, compared indeed uh, the, the different kind of carbon nanomaterials, and we found that really, Indeed, the graphene oxide is a very good quencher of fluorescence. You see here almost 100% quenching of uh, the fluorescence of cadmium selenide. Uh, we took now this uh, very interesting uh, founding, uh, so this phenomena, and we translated this to a simple uh, lateral flow. But to understand this, just to have a look to this uh, operation principle in which we show how this uh, uh, graphene oxide is quenching the fluorescence of cadmium selenide uh, while interacting with uh, uh, some bacteria. Here you see the detection of bacteria using this cadmium selenide uh, modified with antibodies. Uh, 
But in the case uh, when the sample does not contain bacteria, you see here the graphene oxide is almost approaching the quantum dots, so quenching them. But it's not quenching, so the fluorescence is on in the case of the sample that contains bacteria. So you see the distance between the graphene oxide and quantum dots uh, is relatively huge. So we have a kind of uh, digital response uh, in comparison to analog-like response uh, when you have a simple uh, detection system without this uh, uh, approach architecture. So transmitting this to a simple lateral flow was uh, is presented here. And you see that all the components now are inside this paper, a lateral flow in which uh, we try to do the detection of bacteria uh, thanks to this operation and uh, in line, online uh, uh, quenching of uh, uh, cadmium selenide uh, quantum dots by using graphene. Also again here there is this video showing uh, how simple is the process in which uh, we first uh, uh, build the lateral flow, we uh, mount uh, all the components, the, the, the sample pad, uh, uh, conjugation pad and also absorption pad. Uh, we introduce the cadmium selenide quantum dots uh, onto the paper and after the excitation, so with uh, UV visible light, you'll see these uh, uh, quantum dots will, will shine. So you have a uh, uh, very nice fluorescence of cadmium selenide quantum dots. And it is when uh, uh, we introduce the, the graphene oxide uh, uh, graphene oxide suspension uh, during which uh, the quenching of fluorescence is occurring. So this change of the fluorescence uh, is measured and what we do is we correlate uh, this uh, uh, change of the light with the uh, uh, concentration of the uh, uh, bacteria in this case. But of course, uh, if you change uh, the receptor, uh, we can detect uh, other kind of analytes or even we can uh, achieve uh, multi-detection if we use uh, uh, parallel bands or uh, multi-receptor uh, uh, platform. So here is, for example, uh, one application of this uh, quantum dot uh, uh, graphene-based detection system uh, to do some uh, detections with interest uh, for E. coli uh, applied in uh, means beef and river water uh, detection uh, using even some real samples. Uh, Bioreceptors also is very, very interesting uh, to uh, play with and to increase the, the sensitivity of sensors. And here we show a very simple approach in which, as you can see here, we again are using the same format in which uh, the, the antibodies connected with the uh, nanoparticles are there. But now we are using a secondary antibody with uh, uh, more gold nanoparticles, so approaching bearing more gold nanoparticles in the lines uh, in a way that uh, we increase much more uh, the signal. And this was uh, very nicely applied uh, for a very, very interesting application. This was for simultaneous detection of Leishmaniosis, uh, Leishmania DNA, uh, including uh, endogenous control. So uh, thanks to the use of this uh, uh, bioreceptor, we were able to increase, as you can see here, a clear increase of uh, the... Uh, detection line in case of the enhanced assay by using this uh, uh, receptor, secondary receptor with uh, uh, gold nanoparticles. So again, uh, these uh, devices uh, have been applied also for uh, bacteria uh, detection in, uh, in some real samples, uh, river water, in which uh, we are able to apply this uh, uh, in the framework of an European project and also uh, using the same lateral flow uh, for some basic studies. Indeed, here we also show the use of uh, bioluminescence uh, uh, for uh, the detection, but also the study of microfluidics of these uh, uh, devices. Uh, we are moving now toward the uh, uh, combination of lateral flow with uh, electrophoresis, uh, and we show here how this is done. Indeed, we have the same uh, simple lateral flow, optical lateral flow, but now we have inserted some electrodes, uh, negative and positive electrode, and by applying some uh, voltage uh, using a smartphone, and of course, uh, uh, combined with an inverter, uh, uh, we have this uh, uh, built, uh, this electrophoretic cell in which uh, the sample now is moving not only because of the uh, fluidics with zero energy as we did before, but now uh, thanks to the uh, electrophoretic cell. 
So we are trying to, to get advantages of both uh, lateral flow and electrophoresis in terms of uh, uh, separation of the matrix uh, so as to have less interferences. Uh, here you can see uh, how this is operating. You see that once we, ap we apply the whole sample, blood sample, you see here the sample is running and uh, uh, the, the, the matrix is separating. So depending on the size, depending on the charges, uh, we have a uh, uh, delay in uh, approaching the detection line and we are trying to control this uh, so as to have the detection with uh, less uh, matrix effects. And uh, this was uh, indeed uh, uh, showing in this uh, uh, application in which uh, we demonstrated that uh, this combination was really very, very interesting, avoiding interferences and, and even increasing the uh, sensitivity. So uh, these uh, materials, uh, paper in general, are very, very, very interesting. So this is another case, uh, nanopaper, in which uh, we uh, are able to integrate nanomaterials inside this transparent paper and then trying to build uh, very simple devices like as uh, pH paper, in which, uh, uh, thanks to the use of these uh, silver, gold nanoparticles or quantum dots uh, uh, modified nanopaper, we are able to detect different analytes. And now connecting these with antibodies, we want to show uh, uh, as simple as we do with a pH paper, uh, the detection of of any kind of uh, analyte. Uh, for example, here, in combination with this uh, uh, quenching of fluorescence and using of some receptors, we are able to show this piece of paper to, to detect, for example, bacteria or some proteins uh, directly uh, using this uh, approach. Uh, so uh, also we are moving toward uh, uh, some very, very simple uh, devices uh, with interest for different application also. This, uh, paper-based sensors or plastic-based sensors for wearable. And this is a, a case in which uh, we uh, built a fully integrated uh, printed wearable uh, for sweat detection, detection in this case, for example, of uh, uh, some uh, metals uh, with interest for diagnostic, but also uh, the use, fabrication, clean room, uh, free, uh, low cost uh, nanoband electrodes uh, in which uh, we uh, uh, use some uh, patterned uh, different metals, gold uh, uh, patterned, or, but also other metals, uh, uh, and uh, building and encapsulating these uh, in uh, different substrates. Uh, and but just by cutting, we are able to, 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 to take this, uh, to have these nanobands and use these for uh, different application as uh, nanosensors uh, with very high uh, response, uh, very increased response, uh, uh, thanks to the signal to rate, uh, the signal to, to, to noise uh, improvements. Uh, also, another uh, interesting amplification is by using some artificial miniaturized peroxidase, uh, this in collaboration with our partners in, in Italy, in which we use these uh, uh, peptides, uh, uh, a very special peptide that is uh, mimicking peroxidase uh, and use this uh, uh, in uh, lateral flow. Uh, so by using some uh, uh, substrates, we are able to uh, to use to 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 achieve this uh, oxidation of these chromogenic uh, substrates uh, and achieve a very very high sensitive colors uh, appearing in the paper, uh, increasing the response. For example, and this is shown for uh, uh, proof of concept uh, uh, proteins, human IgG uh, detection in comparison to uh, gold nanoparticles. So. Bilateral flow, and this is uh, the last I wanted to show, we can also detect uh, uh, even heavy metals, and this is in cooperation with uh, our partner in Florida, in which uh, we uh, uh, use uh, some uh, special antibodies that are against a complex of cadmium with EDTA. Uh, so instead of using uh, very expensive uh, atomic absorption spectrometry with this uh, less than $1 uh, piece of paper, we were able to detect up to uh, 0.1 uh, PPB cadmium with interest for different applications, including uh, uranium in some underground water, again with the same partner in the United States uh, uh, using a, a smartphone uh, for the detection. So all these uh, uh, 
uh, devices and, uh, and technologies who have been developing mostly for the diagnostics are in use now by our part by our spin-off company uh, paper dropping cooperation with different uh, hospitals uh, uh, trying to uh, bring these uh, uh, technologies to the end users uh, and also in cooperation with our partners in environmental monitoring we have been applying this uh, for the detection of water uh, contaminants in water so with uh, all this, I, I wish that I convince you that uh, lateral flows are very, very interesting devices with a lot of potential, thanks to the use of nanomaterials uh, for different areas, including health, environmental monitoring, safety and security. Uh, if you need more information, there are different reviews wrote uh, about these issues. Uh, uh, you can just ask me if you don't have access uh, and also uh, the recent one on uh, in chemical review and analytical chemistry on these approaches. Uh, uh, finally, I'd like to, to thank all our sponsors, collaborators, but overall, I'd like to thank my, my team who has done, who have been working hard on all these approaches and uh, uh, all this development I showed to you. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to give responses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Makosi. Very thorough and uh, interesting, fascinating talk. Okay, so um, we have some questions in the meeting chat that I'll ask. Uh, feel free, uh, our audience, feel free to continue putting questions into our meeting chat. But I'm going to start off with maybe just a high level question. So, you know, as, as you know, it's been 60 years or so since the lateral flow assay was first demonstrated, I think it was for Glenn yeah. and human plasma. And there's a lot of work going on. There's been lots of publications, but your, your initial vision, you know, has this idea of, you know, we have these everywhere. They're used for a wide variety of things. They're very easy to change the antigen or what we're trying to detect. But, you know, we really haven't reached that full scale vision of these everywhere. What do you think is the reason for this? Is it technological, scientific reasons, economic reasons, or some other reason? Yeah, uh, it's a very, very important uh, comment and question. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, this technology is simple, but uh, uh, also it's complex uh, uh, because there are a lot of components that you need to, to keep under control. You know, uh, uh, it's very important in, in uh, the development and fabrication of devices, all the meteorology of the component, nanometeorology in this case, because we have nanomaterials. Uh, so if you uh, don't keep under control all these uh, components, it's, it's difficult to achieve the right reproducibility you need for mass production of these technologies. So this is uh, what I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, development of such devices uh, needs a closed uh, cooperation also with uh, industry companies that uh, supply you mass production facility, uh, facilities. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, uh, you are not able to achieve the right reproducibility because you need reproducibility in terms of nanomaterials, nanoparticles, for example, reproducibility in terms of uh, uh, receptors. Uh, I didn't mention here, but uh, during COVID, we, we worked a lot uh, with and tested different kinds of receptors, different kinds of antibodies for COVID, and we found that uh, uh, there was a huge discrepancy between the different receptors supplied uh, by the, uh, the company. So uh, we, are, we depend also on the quality of the receptors. So, mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot of uh, factors that affect, uh, uh, but uh, uh, also uh, the integration, the, the full integration of the system, is very, very important. So all these uh, uh, parts of the development are very, very important. And if uh, not connected to industries, it's, it's, it's impossible. So I think one of the most important thing is uh, a close collaboration with industries, with the needs of the end users, so as to drive the, the, the development according to the final application and to have everything under control. Otherwise, uh, uh, everything is going to take time and, and nothing is going to happen. So the reliability, the reproducibility, the control of the manufacturing process. Mm. Um, let's see. So I'll, I'll start asking some of the questions from the chat. Uh, the first one at the top uh, was the idea of using these vertical flow uh, nitrocellulose membranes as compared to the lateral flow. Do you see promise in that technology? 
Yeah, it is an uh, interesting technology because uh, in this technology we uh, combine this uh, uh, sampling uh, of big volumes of samples because uh, sometimes for uh, clinical analysis you need to process uh, to detect a very, very low concentra uh, concentration of analytes in uh, huge uh, volumes. Uh, so 5 milliliters, for example, is a huge volume for uh, you cannot do uh, process 5 milliliter in a simple lateral flow. So with vertical flow, you can take uh, uh, the quantity you want, and in this way, uh, we are somehow concentrating the, the analyte. So uh, this is very interesting. But of course, uh, one of the things that uh, I, it was, it looked nice there. But uh, for example, in the case of uh, uh, PSA detection, the, the clinical scenario is not that easy because there are different forms of PSAs, and uh, this should be combined with uh, multi-detection and uh, mm -hmm. a very careful uh, evaluation of the clinical scenario. But mm -hmm. we wanted just to show the concept from a analytical point of view, but uh, from a clinical point of view, there is a lot of uh, work to do. Right. Uh, let's see. And another question is making lateral assays either quantitative or semi-quantitative for patients at home. Do you see a route to making them more quantitative rather than just qualitative? Yeah, this is uh, something that uh, we are working, but also other groups are working because uh, transforming the lateral flow to a quantitative assay is possible thanks to these uh, different approaches, for example, working with uh, uh, more sensitive labels, uh, but also with uh, uh, detection mode. So mm -hmm. going, moving from NATI to the uh, smartphone application or readers, special readers. So, and indeed, special readers can uh, transform this. And in, in market, uh, there are also uh, lateral flows that are quantitative, even uh, for pregnancy tests showing uh, the, how many weeks are uh, you pregnant and so on. So these are quantitative or semi-quantitative, yeah. Um, you showed a variety of different materials, quantum dots and other things. Um, what about the cost? Do you see for some of these nanomaterials like quantum dots, do they cost more? Is, is, is that a concern? Yeah, indeed, there are different kinds of nanomaterials and uh, there are concerns, for example, in relation to the uh, quantum dots based on metal uh, particles because uh, of the toxicity. So uh, we are... Uh, now interested in use of uh, uh, carbon dots, uh, uh, but uh, that are somehow uh, uh, sustainable because uh, biocompatible. But the problem is that uh, they are very, very small and it's very, very difficult to, uh, uh, to conjugate and to control the purity of these uh, 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 as labels. Uh, but I mean, uh, uh, Although the, the, the quantum dots are very, very uh, much more sensitive, uh, the issues related to either toxicity or uh, purification uh, uh, grade is an issue still. Yeah. Um, let's see. You, you didn't talk too much about nonspecific absorption of the gold nanoparticle detection antibody on the nano uh, crystalline membrane. Can you talk a little bit about nonspecific absorption and the challenges there? Yeah, nonspecific absorption are always a challenge for uh, the assays based on nanoparticles, not only for lateral flow, but all kinds of assays, because you may have uh, nonspecific absorption uh, coming uh, everywhere, either in the uh, nanoparticles, uh, if uh, there is not a uh, blocking, uh, well, good blocking of uh, uh, nanoparticles, but also in the uh, paper, nitrocellulose, in the detection line, for example, uh, blocking of the surfaces is very, very important. And using of uh, uh, blocking strategies is, is very, very important while you develop uh, these kind of devices. So using uh, uh, different kind of chemistry for... Uh, either uh, for nanoparticles, but also for for uh, cellulose. So this is very important. It's an issue always. Yeah. Great. Let's see. Um, there's a question of whether there's been any collaboration between ICN2 and ESA on nanosensor, nanosensors for space applications. Do you envision, how do you envision this application? Is it feasible in the European context or perhaps through collaboration with NASA? 
Yeah, would we'll be very happy. There is a, a so far we haven't uh, any collaboration, so I'd be very happy to discuss about this because uh, uh, these devices are very very interesting, very simple to be used even for these uh, uh, people. Uh, cosmonauts, for example, or, or in these uh, special conditions. So I think this may be a very, very interesting area of application, so given the simplicity. So for, and you can, in principle, uh, apply this for different kinds of detection, uh, broad range of analyze so that may be with interest, uh, either related to health, but also with uh, presence of different uh, uh, species you want to detect, uh, and of course, it uh, uh, would, would be very, very interesting uh, to, 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 to design and to preview the architecture of these devices under specific conditions uh, uh, in this kind of application. So this is uh, very challenging, but uh, I'll be very happy to discuss. Uh, let's see, a specific technical question. Um, how did you perform the conjugation of the iridium oxide? Did you notice whether any agglomerates and whether it led to some plasmonic shift of the gold? Yeah, indeed, this was uh, this is something that uh, my colleagues are still working. Uh, so we have been uh, using uh, physical absorption normally because uh, these are for single use only, but of course uh, you can apply uh, other kind of strategies using some uh, specific linkers that can connect. Uh, so we have been using different strategies, uh, uh, but uh, simple physical absorption has been something that uh, has been working fine. Right. Uh, let's see. Uh, a prior question that we got, um, the lateral flow test is only as good as the sample that is provided. Are you, you know, do you see the lack of standardization and self-collected samples affect performance? Uh, and, and what do you think could be done there? Yeah, uh, uh, as a, if I understood well, so the standardization of lateral flow, right? Uh, so Well, and, and, and specifically with respect to sample collection, because, you know, that's not... Yeah thing that's, you know, you yeah. specifically talked about, but it's an important part to their final Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, sampling is uh, as important as the detection itself. So if you do not control sampling, so uh, has no sense. So, uh, so sampling uh, is uh, crucial in lateral flow. I didn't uh, talk about this because uh, indeed there are different ways. And you can see, for example, or people have been seeing this during COVID, uh, how the sampling has been done, but also another application of lateral flow. We are not working uh, exactly in development of uh, uh, specific sampling, uh, uh, considering that uh, we are working in the laboratory phase in which we are pipetting, but uh, sampling is very, very important. And there are uh, different strategies, and this may affect a lot to the map. It may affect, but is crucial uh, and should be seen together with uh, the detection. It's very, very important. Um, you showed a lot of different approaches, different materials, uh, geometry, different nanoparticles to try to improve performance. Um, maybe if you could sort of summarize, you know, which of those do you see is the most valuable moving forward or the most important in terms of improving the performance of an LFA? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I try to show uh, different uh, strategies that can uh, uh, affect the performance of uh, uh, a sensor. Uh, indeed, uh, there are a lot of parameters that uh, should be kept under control. I wanted to show that each of these parameters uh, play an important role in the, the, the performance. Uh, but depending on, the, on the, the application, depending also on the uh, uh, know-how that uh, one may have and want to, to apply, uh, there are possibilities. So if, for example, uh, uh, in the lab you are good in, in uh, uh, microfabrication and you want to apply these uh, strategies that are based on the uh, change of fluidics, uh, you can just apply a standard protocol based on in terms of uh, nanoparticles and then uh, play with this uh, microfabricated uh, uh, fabrication of the device and changing of the geometry. But uh, if you are good in, in uh, development of uh, uh, very good labels like uh, quantum dots, for example, and you just want to use a standard geometry, you just uh, uh, focus on these uh, uh, quantum dots. So 
Uh, I mean, uh, uh, there are uh, strategies that one can work according to the need, according to the application, according to the know-how. Uh, so uh, I, I cannot, uh, uh, I cannot uh, imagine, for example, something that uh, includes everything, but uh, or, or optimizing everything. So it's possible. So to apply different strategies and get something that is uh, with higher response, but it will depend on the application. Sometimes, uh, uh, depending on. Uh, not only uh, on the kind of analyte, but the kind of sample and the scenario you are going to apply your device, you need to do something or uh, different. So. Yeah. We're almost at time, but I'll ask one final question that came in to the chat. Um, when considering the performance of LFAs, do you feel like sensitivity is the primary goal? Or do you think it's some of these other factors and parameters that you've talked about the stability, the manufacturability. Yeah, also this is a very important question and very analytical question because uh, I again uh, would like to understand the scenario you want to apply your device. So if you are, for example, uh, uh, working for uh, some, uh, let's say, uh, a certain disease uh, during, for example, certain therapies in which uh, the changes of the uh, the, the, the analyte uh, uh, are relatively in a broad range uh, in which, uh, let's say, the, the, the effect of the, the drug is occurring uh, open the, the body. So you need probably to have a broader range of response, uh, but also you may need probably to have a higher sensitivity. But uh, if you want to reach something that... Uh, is, uh, uh, for example, related to uh, uh, toxicity or uh, presence of some bacteria or cancer cells, uh, you need to have a very, very low uh, detection limit. Uh, and then uh, do not uh, preoccupy about uh, a broader range of response, but you just want to, to reach uh, a very, very low detection limit. So it depends on the, the, the scenario. So, I mean, but in general, all are important. But sometimes you don't need, for example, if your device is going to be applied for a certain range, you don't need to have uh, to work uh, very much in, in broadening the range of response. Or if uh, you don't need to reach a very low detection limit, you just focus on a certain range and then with certain sensitivity. So it depends on the application. Great. Well, we're... A little over time, so I'm afraid we're going to have to stop there. I would like to thank you again, Dr. Mikosi, for such a great and interesting uh, presentation. For all of our attendees, there is a link in the chat to fill out a survey about today's talk, uh, and we hope that uh, we see you again at our next Blue Lecture. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Arben. Thank you very much. Have a nice uh, uh, afternoon. Uh, have a nice day and uh, see you next time. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm leaving.